Hello, my name is Dr. Roderick L. Roll, and today I will be talking to you about the innate immunity. Innate means things that you were born with. So the innate immunity is the portion of your immune system that you were born with. This system can be subdivided into two major groups the first line of defense and the second line of defense. If we look at the picture below, we have a concept map. This concept map starts with the host defenses. This is your immune system. It is separated into the innate portion, that's what you were born with, and the acquired portion, that is what you develop as you get older. So we're only going to talk about, in this slideshow, the innate immune response. This is nonspecific, and it is further subdivided into the first line of defense and the second line of defense. We will talk extensively about the first line of defense in this slideshow. Within the first line of defense, we have two categories, the physical barriers and the chemical barriers. The physical barrier will separate the inside from the outside, whereas the chemical barrier are going to be chemicals that your body will release or secrete that will help protect you from the outside elements. The physical barriers can be further separated into the external and the internal barrier. We will discuss the external, which is the skin or the integumentary system, and the internal physical barrier, which is the mucosal lining. The mucosal lining makes up things like the inner portion of your oral cavity. The external physical barriers include the skin. The skin is the largest organ in the human body and it is composed of the epidermis and the dermis. Below those two layers is a subcutaneous layer. It is below the skin and it is called the hypodermis. In the picture below, we're looking at those three layers. The top two layers are considered the skin, and below that is the hypodermis. The hypodermis contains the fat in the body, and the other two layers are the epidermis and the dermis. The most superficial is the epidermis. Within the epidermis, you have between four or five layers of tissue. The most superficial layer is the stratum corneum and those cells are dead. The most deep of the four layers in this picture is the stratum basalis layer. So basal is the base, the basement, the bottom. So that is the bottom portion of the epidermis. As these cells grow outwardly, these cells will become compacted and they will die. So the deepest layers are living and the most superficial layers are dead. These layers will be shedded they will slough off. They will be removed through abrasion and just randomly falling off. This is called desquamation. So the removal of the dead skin cells is desquamation. The living cells produce an insoluble protein called keratin. So deeper 
in the epidermis, let's say the stratum basal layer and the stratum spinosum, those cells are producing this insoluble protein that helps to uh, create an impenetrable membrane, an uh, impenetrable layer, and it also helps to waterproof um, the tissue also. Very few pathogens can actually penetrate this impenetrable wall that is created by the protein that is produced from this this uh, multi-tissue layer structure called the epidermis. In reference to the thickness of these layers, in the soles of the feet and the palms of the hand, these layers are going to be thicker. These layers of cells. So in the picture below, we're looking at a cross section of the epidermis. To the far right we have thick versus thin skin. Notice that the stratum corneum is much thicker on the thick skin. So because the thick skin receives more abrasions, more mechanical stresses, it will develop extra layers of dead tissue. This is going to be a protective me measure for the palms of the hand and the soles of the feet. Additionally, where you see this thick skin, you also have a extra layer. So no longer do you have four layers, you have five layers of tissue for the epidermis. The fifth layer is the stratum lucidum. The deeper portion of the skin is called the dermis. So this is below the epidermis. The dermis will contain protein fibers called collagen. And collagen helps in the innate immune response because it is going to give strength and pliability to the skin. This is going to help the skin resist abrasions Therefore, the microbe cannot penetrate and get into your body or into your tissue. In this slide, we are comparing loose connective tissue to dense connective tissue. What I want you to get from this slide is that there is a tissue that is called connective tissue. Within the dermis of the skin, you have connective tissue that makes it up. The other physical barrier is internal. It is called the mucous membrane. It lines all body cavities that are open to the outside environment. In this image below, we're looking at the trachea the lining of the trachea that faces the air. In this picture we have the ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. This is a tall columnar cell and when you line them up side by side and you take the nuclei for each cell and put them into different positions some at the top some in the middle and some at the bottom of this long column like cell it would appear as if it is a multi-layer tissue but it's only one layer of cells so they call it false multi-layer columnar epithelial tissue more importantly, on the superficial portion of those cells, you have cilia. So this is the structure of the tissue that makes up the inner lining of the trachea. That is a physical barrier that protects us from the inside. So this is an internal physical barrier. 
the internal tissue layer is composed of two distinct layers the outer epithelium which is composed of cells that will not produce keratin and a deeper connective tissue layer that supports the epithelium so in the skin the external skin those cells produce a waterproofing insoluble protein and it helps to create an impervious layer in the internal tissue we don't have that those cells do not produce the insoluble keratin what supports the epithelium is the deeper connective tissue And like I mentioned before, the connective tissue is a supportive like tissue. It is seen in the dermis of the skin and under the epithelium layer of the internal epithelium. Unlike surface epithelial cells of the skin, the epithelial cells here are living remember in the skin as the cells get older they get pushed outwardly and they become flat and they die these cells of the internal tissue layer are not going to die they're going to be living these cells will also produce mucus so the mucous membrane epithelial cells are bathed with mucus they are tightly packed to prevent entry of pathogens and the continuous shedding of cells will occur which will help remove the microorganisms away from the lungs if we're talking about the trachea So let's look at the trachea. If the trachea has cilia, what happens is the microbes that get into your trachea will be moved upwardly towards the pharynx. In the image, we have our pseudostratified epithelial layer and on top the most superficial portion you see the cilia. So once we get foreign debris inside of our trachea, our body tries to get rid of it. What happens is if we look at this picture, a rod-shaped bacteria has penetrated, has gotten into our trachea. Now it is going to stick to the sticky mucosal membrane lining and the cilia are going to move the bacteria up towards the pharynx then you will cough up this bacteria into the pharynx and swallow it into the esophagus now we will discuss the chemical barriers so the innate immune response is separated into the first line of defense and under the first line we just finished the physical barriers which is separated into external and internal now we will look at chemical barriers the first chemical barrier is sweat sweat is scientifically referred to as perspiration so perspiration is secreted by the sweat glands, the sudoriferous gland. And within perspiration, you will have electrolytes such as sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium. You will have antimicrobial peptides. You will have lysozymes. 
and you will have lactic acid. The electrolytes can inhibit microbial growth. One example is salt. Salt is secreted in sweat. It is going to create a, hypo, a hypertonic solution. Therefore, only organisms like Staphylococcus aureus can grow on the surface of skin. This bacteria is a facultative halophile. Halophile means an, it is an organism that can live in the presence of salt. So the electrolytes help to reduce microbial growth on the skin. Antimicrobial peptides. These peptides, defensin and dermocytins, can also destroy the bacteria by puncturing their cell membranes. We have lysozymes. Lysozymes are also in perspiration. It is going to destroy the cell wall of bacteria. And lactic acid is in perspiration. It is going to decrease the pH. Most of the bacteria that can harm you are neutrophiles, meaning that they must live in the presence of a neutral pH. If you decrease the pH to a more acidic environment, only certain microbes can exist. The next chemical process or chemical barrier is saliva. Saliva is in the oral cavity and it contains, contains lysozyme. Lysozyme will also destroy the bacterial cell wall. The next chemical process is sebum. Sebum is oil that is secreted from the sebaceous gland. This oil is going to help keep the skin pliable. If the skin is pliable, then it is less likely to break or tear. If the skin breaks or tears, then the bacteria can penetrate the bloodstream or the tissue. Also, sebum is going to lower the pH. If it lowers the pH, only acidophiles can exist. The next chemical process is the lysozyme that is contained within tears. Tears are secreted from the lacrimal gland and the tears are going to bathe the eye and they will help to destroy bacteria that, that may be introduced into the eye as irritants. Another chemical process is secreted from the mebomian gland. Mebum is a oily substance that has antimicrobial capability and it is also secreted to the eye in the eyelid and it is going to help reduce bacteria from growing on the eyelid. The next chemical process is cerumen. Cerumen is going to be secreted from the ceruminous gland that is located in the external ear canal. This oily substance is going to deter insects and block entry into the canal. The next chemical process is produced from cells of the stomach. The cells of the stomach are the parietal cells. They're going to produce hydrochloric acid which will lower the pH in the stomach. Therefore only acidophiles 
can exist in the stomach. The next chemical process that has antimicrobial capability is the pancreatic juices that come from the pancreas and the bile that comes from the liver. Both of these chemicals are going to be secreted into the first portion of the small intestine that is called the duodenum. Both of these chemicals will help destroy microbes. The male urethra is not sterile. So therefore within an ejaculation the male might contaminate the vagina. So therefore in the secretions of an ejaculation you have seminal fluid. The seminal fluid is going to contain antimicrobial properties because it has this enzyme called lysozymes. These lysozymes will destroy the bacterial cell wall. The vaginal tract is not sterile either. It is colonized by bacteria like lactobacillus. But this lactobacillus is going to help the woman. It will produce lactic acid which will decrease the acidity, I mean which will increase the acidity and therefore when you lower the pH it's going to make the environment unfavorable for pathogenic bacteria. So this is a protective measure also. So all of these are chemical processes that our bodies will produce or secrete to help us and in fighting off infections and it is part of the innate immune response. So to conclude we've talked about the innate immune response just the portion containing the first line of defense. We looked at the physical barrier and we looked at the chemical barrier.